get started now, and we're going to um, do this a little bit differently. I think Julie mentioned that this is a new approach for us, and what we thought we'd do is have the entire team uh, present. We're focusing on very common symptoms that we see in MSA, PSP, and advanced Parkinson's disease, and the team is actually going to demonstrate how they uh, not only present each area and what their discipline would do, but also how they might um, involve the other discipline or do an ass a quick assessment. Again, we mentioned yesterday that some of the assessment questions that you can utilize for cross-discipline referrals are in your resource manual. And there are also things that you could just hand, a page that you could hand to your patient to have them just go through and then advocate for themselves at, with their primary care physician or their neurologist or whatever. So we are going to, um, since we're doing eight different uh, symptoms, we are going to take a break after the first four. And at that time, they will take questions on those first four. And then we'll take a break, and then they'll come back, present the last four, and take questions again. So since we're filming, once again, if you can hold your questions till that time, and then each speaker will remember to repeat the question uh, so that we can get it on the film. So um, everybody pretty much knows our team. Uh, those of you who are new to today are part of our Team PD network already. But just as a reminder, we have Jenny Wilhelm, who's our physical therapist, Amy Mooney, who's our speech language pathologist, and Amy Fielder, who's our occupational therapist. And so I will get out of the way and let them take it from here. OK, so I'm Amy Mooney, and I'm a speech and language pathologist. And um, like Lisa said, today we're going to compare and contrast um, the rehabilitation needs for patients with MSA PSP and advanced Parkinson's uh, with dementia. And so these are the four areas that we're going to, or pardon me, the eight areas that we're going to cover today. And so when we were thinking about this presentation, we wanted to try and make it um, more functional, more accessible for people, more interactive. And so we really thought about what are the, what are the symptoms or the problems that impact or impair people in daily life the most. And so these are the eight areas that we came up with. So while we present today, we're gonna to try and be pretty fluid, just as we would if we were in a team meeting with one another, kind of jumping in and adding our input from, or from our different discipline specific uh, place. Um, so some things that we want to do is identify discipline specific treatments, and then of course, coordinating that inner or transdisciplinary team care. And the one thing we wanna make sure that comes through in all of this is that these diseases are very rapidly progressive, progressive and they're changing so much. And so it's really important that you change your intervention as the disease progresses and that you do a really kind of aggressive job of anticipating what the next stage or phase might be for the patient and their care providers. And again, so that you're changing your intervention. All right, Jenny's gonna start with falls. Okay, and one more thing I'd just like to add to what Amy said is I think Leanne said it really well this morning. I think us as healthcare professionals um, see these patients a lot more frequently than maybe the neurologist sees them. And so we can sometimes see this rapid progression and I think having an open communication um, with the neurologist about that of you may be seeing some of these red flag items and we'll highlight some cases um, as we go through these slides but just kind of be thinking about your role um, as an advocate for the patient as well for these clients. So we thought we'd kick off our different conditions with falls. Um, Amy Peterson talked about this a lot this morning. Falls are a really big um, concept in both Parkinson's Plus diseases and late stage Parkinson's. Um, with the Parkinson's Plus, they're often gonna occur right after they're diagnosed versus the late stage, they're gonna occur several years um, after they're diagnosed with just Parkinson's. And it's important to realize that falls um, can definitely decrease confidence, but they can also result in loss of function. Oftentimes, these can also result in death, um, depending on if they have hip fracture or land on their head and end up with a subdural. 
So I'm just gonna kind of go through what are the characteristics of PSP, MSA, and late stage Parkinson's in relationship to falls. I try to find a picture of a person with PSP and all I could find was this really old picture <laughs> from a classic textbook. But I thought it showed fairly well that axial rigidity that was talked about this morning as well as that posterior center of gravity. Um, so again, falls is an early sign of PSP. It's key in the diagnosis and oftentimes these people tend to be falling backwards. And again, I think that is just because this tends to be their static stance. So as I tell a lot of my patients, if a strong wind were to blow, they're going to go backwards more than any other direction. They have that dystonic rigidity of the neck and the upper trunk. The neck is going to be a bigger problem when we come into um, swallowing and communication later this afternoon. Their gait is described as a drunken sailor. So this is going to be much different than your Parkinson's gait. It's going to be clumsy, slow, and unsteady, unlike the short, shuffly steps that you might see with the idiopathic Parkinson's. Um, we talked a lot this morning, the vertical gaze palsy. What does that mean in terms of falls? It means they're not looking down at the floor. So they can't see the curbs, they can't see the steps, they can't see the throw rugs, they can't see um, the dog leash that might be lying on the floor. So this is gonna lead to lots of tripping hazards. On top of that, they have that impulsivity and poor insight to deficits, which you can imagine how that's gonna magnify um, their balance deficits. And, um, Oftentimes, as physical therapists, we can identify these fallers, not just by doing balance assessments that we talked about yesterday or gait analysis, but really looking at that dual task activity because of the cognitive impairment. Um, I think all of us worked really hard on this presentation to try to include some evidence, but I'll be honest, there's not a lot of evidence for these populations. Um, it's a fairly rare disease. You know, Julie said yesterday about 3% of all the people um, have Parkinson's plus. So you can imagine once you start breaking those out into the special diagnoses, the N is just not that great on most of these studies, but we tried our hardest. <coughs> so this was a kind of an interesting study just looking at how quickly people are going to progress in terms of gait deficits. So they followed 50 people with, Park with PSP um, for years, which I thought was really, really nice. 21 of those people died over the course of the four and a half years, um, and 29 of the people were still living at the conclusion of this study. And it showed that the three milestones they were looking at in terms of gait was loss of independent walking, inability to stand without help, and requiring the use of a wheelchair. And I found it really interesting that once you hit one, you were really likely to hit the other one within a relatively short amount of time. And again, that just kind of speaks to the fact of how rapid it is. And I know as a therapist, sometimes I'll describe these patients as I feel like I'm chasing the patient as they're just kind of rolling downhill and I'm never able to really get in front of them and stop the progression. Um, so these are the patients, as soon as you get them a walker, then they're ready for a wheelchair. As soon as you get them the manual wheelchair, that's not enough. Um, so they're really difficult to treat therapeutically. Also, all of those milestones, again, occurred with right around the five year mark from symptom onset or about three years after the first visit, and that's with a neurologist. So again, we might be seeing people in those two years prior to their diagnosis. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So now we're gonna compare it to MSA. Here you're also gonna have balance problems, but your patients are gonna mu look much different. Amy Peterson kind of talked about there's the three different subtypes of MSA. The Sarah Beller, subtype, MSA type C, is going to kind of show ataxia-like symptoms. Um, and their gait is going to be narrow base and unsteady. So recently, one of the providers at the Parkinson Center sent us a patient. And I was doing my initial assessment, diagnosis of Parkinson's. He's had it for maybe a year or two. So this guy makes us cakes every week when he comes in to see, see us. A lot of patients, or a lot of my coworkers, that are very upset because he's coming close to discharge. And um, when I did the modified cat sieve on him, he's standing on foam. He got this great, like, oscillatory motion back and forth that we see with a lot of the cerebellar patients. And that was kind of my first red flag of there's something else going on here because we don't see that with the idiopathic. 
Um, then he, on the one month follow up, he had made almost no progression in any of his outcome measures, despite the fact that he's completely compliant in his exercises. He does an hour of exercises every day. So at our team meeting, I brought up my concerns, and the speech therapist um, that's seen him for voice also said he had a toxic like gate or speech um, signs. So we're going to try to get him back into the neurologist sooner rather than later because we're just seeing those red flags um, and feel like maybe he needs to be seen sooner than that six month follow up that was currently planned. Um, oftentimes, these MSA patients will have bilateral involvement. So again, that kind of stands them out from the idiopathic. They're going to have this slowness and rigidity that you'll see in Parkinson's. Initial symptoms in the trunk and lower extremities. Oftentimes with the Parkinson's patients, we identify them with the lack of the arm swing, where these symptoms are going to be a little bit lower for MSA. And sometimes the falls can occur to orthostatic hypotension. And we'll be covering orthostatic hypotension in depth later on. Late stage Parkinson's, as you can imagine, falls is a huge deal. Here there was a study where they looked at 50 people in Honan Yar stage four and five, average duration about 18 years. And I don't think the first finding was that surprising to us. The longer you have the disease, the higher the rate of falling. Um, falls occurred in 50% of patients, 28% had daily falls. So that was a little surprising to me. Part of me as a physical therapist thinks, why is this person not in a wheelchair? Um, but that probably might get into the cognitive issues perhaps that we'll cover later on. 30% of the falls are caused by freezing. So that is a huge thing to kind of think about in terms of treatment strategies. Cause an extreme impact on patients' perceived health status. Tying in with what Julie was talking about, you can also imagine what this is going to do for caregiver strain. So I'll often get referrals in physical therapy for a patient that's having falls. And one thing that we're going to try to do today is have, offer screening questions. So when I'm seeing that patient that maybe does not have an OT or a speech referral, what are common questions that I'll ask? So I may ask, are you having difficulty doing the things that you need to get done every day? Getting dressed, going to the bathroom, or are some of these things actually contributing to your falls? If so, that's a flag for OT. I also might say, maybe to the care partner, when Bob gets up from the chair, does he sometimes forget to take his walker? If so, that might be a flag to the speech therapist. Maybe she can work with me and we'll give some examples later of how we've combined efforts on remembering to bring the walker when they get up all the time. Case study is Susan. Susan was sent to me by one of our providers. Um, she had PSP and Unfortunately, she had just come to the Parkinson Center. My guess is she probably had symptoms for five to eight years. Um, she was in a wheelchair, and the reason she was sent to physical therapy is because she was falling out of the wheelchair several times a day. She'd already dislocated one shoulder, torn the rotator cuff in another shoulder, and was on the brink of getting kicked out of her um, assisted living facility because she was falling so much. Neurologist had no idea what to do, so she said, we'll send them the PT and they can figure it out. Um, Susan pretty much was nonverbal. So she had had some physical therapy in the town that she was from. She came from about an hour away. Um, and so I taught them the simple yes, no system to get through the evaluation. In which case I asked Susan, are some of the falls occurring because you need to go to the bathroom and you're trying to get up? and we got a solid yes. Are some of the falls occurring because you're in pain and you're trying to get up? And we got a solid yes. At the end of that session, A, I know we needed OT um, to help with arm movement, vision movement. She was totally um, dependent for feeding. And I also knew we needed speech to help with OGCOM. The daughter was crying because this is the first time she communicated with her mom in three years using the simple yes and no system. She had no idea. Um, do you have anything you want to add, Amy? Because you've helped this family quite a bit. Yeah, in this case, I think when we talk about dementia or cognitive deficits, you do have to assess every patient. Because it was, I think the assumption was, she's demented. Of course she can't communicate. And so 
no one ever tried the yes-no system with her. Um, and also, just to add to this, I think it's important for those who work in assisted living facilities, foster homes, is to know the actual laws. Um, I hear frequently, well, they told me it's against the law to do this and this, even if it's just a positioning device, not a restraint. And in her case, um, they really had to f tease it out, what was a restraint, what was a positioning device, and how we could um, sign a form or just say that this is a positioning, since she could then communicate. Yeah, because what I did as a physical mm -hmm. therapist is worked on getting her a better seating system in her wheelchair to decrease the pain, worked on getting her a seat belt, and then worked on getting her referrals for OT and speech so that she could communicate her needs um, to her care partners. So I only saw her a few times, and in those few times she completely stopped falling. Um, so I think not necessarily doing gait and balance training is what she needed. She just needed help in getting to the right people. So what do I do for a person that's falling that has PSP? Again, knowing that their center of gravity is likely posterior, one thing you can do is do a heel wedge either in the shoe or on the shoe to kind of throw them forward. Um, I'm a huge fan of using post-it notes because they're cheap and in the clinic and infinitely um, adjustable. So you can use those as kind of like little heel wedges within the shoe. Um, the U-step walker, which I showed you yesterday, there's also um, the example um, kind of behind as you come in. Because it's a little bit heavier and because of the reverse style weight uh, brakes, this walker works really, really well for this population if you can get them to use it consistently. Um, I'll work a lot on increasing step height to improve clearance. Again, I know functionally, at a certain point, they're not going to be looking down. So let's work on high marching as they walk through their apartment. Um, so if there is something, they'll be able to step over it. Working on posterior, ste posterior stepping strategies. When I start to go backwards, being able to take a step out of it. Because a lot of these people will just fall backwards like a tree. Um, and then increasing the base of support for ADLs, the strong stance. Yesterday, I think I called it the Tai Chi stance. So again, kind of having your feet staggered. So as you kind of lean back, you're able to shift that weight backward on the one foot. Um, for some of these people, depending on how bad their gaze stability is, we'll actually put great big X's on the floor of where their feet should be in different locations. So by the refrigerator, you should have one foot on one X and one foot on one X, and then they know that they're in that stance. The question is, are they able to look down and see them? Um, so there's actually two case studies on body weight support for Parkinson's Plus that have been published, and basically both of them show improvement. So I'll let you kind of read through these. I believe these are, are also included on the disc. I can tell you that I also saw a patient with PSP for probably a year and a half or so. She lived in California, and so she would fly up about once a quarter. She was in another study here at OHSU, and we got her on a body weight support system. Um, the husband actually was able to purchase one for their home, and he did this religiously with her every single day. And it improved her quality of life, it improved her transfers. Was she a functional ambulator? No, but her got, it got her up and it got her moving. Um, so this is a great possibility of treatment that you can use with these patients. And here's the other one. This was interesting. It was, it's not straight PSP. Um, the gentleman had a mixture of PSP plus CBD for six years. And this was a longitudinal study over two and a half years. And although there wasn't great improvement, there wasn't also a lot of decline. So again, knowing that this is a rapidly progressive disease, I think this says a lot about maintaining activity and how it can have um, a lot of in positive impacts on your patients. For MSA, what am I gonna do as a physical therapist? It kinda depends on what type of MSA they have. For the cerebellar form, I'm gonna work on coordination exercises trying to narrow their basis support if they had that wide waddling support. Work a lot on unstable surfaces. So that gentleman that I talked to you about that couldn't stand on the foam and was back and forth like this, we're standing on a towel. Um, standing on the foam just I don't think is therapeutic for him because it's way too hard. But 
I'm trying to incorporate some of the instability in surfaces that he may encounter out in the environment. And with these people, I'll do a lot of strengthening of trunk and hip and shoulder girdle. Same thing I'll do with Huntington patients or just a toxic patient. So we're kind of strong from the inside to help control some of our movements. The MSAP, I'm going to treat them very similar as the normal Parkinson's patients. And the MSAA, the big thing there is the orthostatic hypotension and is that playing a component into the falls. In which case, giving them a four-wheel walker, so if I start to feel faint, I can sit right here. Um, or perhaps a transport wheelchair. A lot of these people will start restricting their um, activity out in the community because they're afraid they're not going to be able to get from point A to point B. So giving them a transport wheelchair so they can still enjoy activities with their family. For late stage Parkinson's, um, this was a study that only the average duration of the disease was 11 years. And what they were looking at was just what's impaired in terms of their balance. So these people were looking at both quiet stance and dynamic stability. They did um, some of the tests on with posturography with the balance master, and then some with force place that moved. And they found that there's decreased ability to balance with vision when vision or proprioception is deserve, disturbed, and there's a high reliance on vision even if it's conflicted. So this can automatically start giving you some ideas of treatment interventions that you can do with these patients in the later stages. Um, also, postural strategies were usually ineffective to keep balance and avoid falls, especially under the dynamic conditions. So you can work on ankle, hip, and stepping strategies for these people. Um, yesterday, I kind of briefly mentioned the sunglasses and the basketball dribbling glasses, which are shown up here. You can get those at Dick's or any sporting goods store or online. Um, I'll have a lot of patients get them. If I have patients get them, I have them have a safety zone that they can use them in, because as you can imagine, we did a presentation here last year and one of the presenters was wearing them and we were concerned about the edge of the stage as she was walking around with them. Um, they can be a safety hazard if used inappropriately. Um, but trying to do some sensory integration training to decrease that reliance on the vision, get them used to using their proprioception and vestibular systems, working on unstable surfaces, postural reactions, and then looking at different assistive equipment. And I said the assistive equipment is difficult because of the rapid progression of the disease. So kind of trying to think the next step ahead for these patients. Now I'm going to hand it to OT. Okay, so for PSP, my focus on this diagnosis is what Jenny was talking about, that I'm anticipating they're going to be falling backwards and their vision is going to be an issue for clutter or for any kind of barrier, walking in the street, safely looking side to side before they cross the street, looking at curbs. Um, a lot of times, I really believe in home safety evals for these clients. and especially when Jenny was talking about the rapidly progressing the disease, is really looking at equipment needs ahead of time. Um, not having, especially if they're only going to see you once or twice, or if they're coming to you from a rural area, and you know this might be my only chance, and they might not see a therapist until a year from now when they come back to see their doctor. So really be thinking about and educating them so they're not having to reinvent the wheel later when they're on their own in their own community. So for PSP, um, especially dangerous areas are when they're going up the front steps to open up their screen door and they pull it back and then they fall backwards. So having a grab bar right there or if someone still is going down to the basement, I see a lot of falls right at the end of the basement or trying to go up to that first step of the basement, having a grab bar right there with the lighting, of course. Um, the closets, bringing the closet rods down Looking at the kitchen, the one gentleman, oh, I'll wait on that for the cake. I'll write, talk about that in the next slide. Um, carrying items, if they're carrying it like this as they walk, you know, educating them about how can they do that better, assessing their gait with in functional tasks. Um, and the visual environment. Um, and this could be for the visual environment. We see some falls in the bathroom, and the complaint will be, well, I told him 
reach for the grab bar, and then he's not reaching for it, he's reaching for the shampoo bottle. And if you look at the shower, the shower tile was white, the bath seat was white, the grab bars were white, because they wanted it to look nice, and then it's 100 shampoo bottles. And so we kind of got rid of all the shampoo bottles but one. We put, because they already had the grab bar there, so we did waterproof taping, a bright color, so then they could at least say it, it stuck out more. They were more apt to grab the grab bar at that point. For MSA, I'm really looking at, I look a lot more in the bathroom area when those people are first waking up in the morning and they have to go to the bathroom and I'm thinking, how can we prevent the falls from orthostatic hypotension, which we will talk about later. But I am spending most of my time on that area, clearing the pathways, what's the easiest way to get there, incorporating the caregiver, um, and again, determining the appropriate DME needs. Um, Right, making recommendations that they can only afford a certain one piece of equipment, let's make sure that one's going to count, that's going to last them longer. Um, and the, I find resistance when I work with end stage or moderate stage PD and stage PD and PSP and MSA at times of not wanting to sit down for their ADLs. They want to stand up to put their pants on. They want to stand up to put their socks on. And so what I've been trying lately is trying to do more education up front and practicing up front so it's more of a habit before they get to that point to see if that will increase safety. And when I'm doing, looking at vision training, I am trying to improve their search patterns and their route finding. If they're, the one benefit of the U-step walker being bigger is that they kind of have to do a wider turn so it gives them a chance to scan their environment easier rather than doing a pivot turn. Um, I kind of talked a little bit already about the contrast sensitivities. And the DynaVision I will talk a little bit later about. But I, one comment, people, when they come to see Jenny, it is so motivating for them to walk. And it's like, it's such a huge quality of life boost for them, for most of them. And when we see people from nursing homes, a lot of them haven't walked maybe for a year because of the fear of falling. So even though we want to make sure they're safe, we do want to give them that quality of life um, and, and train the restorative aid or train the family member to make it the safest way possible. So in terms of uh, looking at falls from the speech and language pathologist perspective, first of all, Jenny gave a great example of today looking at is communication contributing to these falls? Um, is because the person can't communicate their needs, whether it's having to use the bathroom or pain to their care partner and they're getting out of their chair. Um, so of course that would be looking at managing their dysarthria, which we talked a lot about yesterday and I'll talk more about later today. Um, and then Particularly with PSP, we want to look at and is cognition contributing to their falls? And we've talked a lot about the element of impulsivity being a big portion of the cognitive profile for patients with PSP. And if it is, what can we do about it? So we've tried a lot of different things. Sometimes we're able to post a sign right on the wheelchair, which is right, or the walker, which is right next to the patient that says, use your wheelchair every time you walk, or use your walker every time you walk. So sometimes using an environmental cue will be helpful. Um, sometimes using an alerting lanyard, that means every time you get up, you gotta press it to make sure someone's here with you to get out of bed or get out of um, your chair. Um, or having some sort of emotion alarm if the dementia is so far past that um, they're not able to recall that step, but to keep them safe because they are gonna get up. Um, and then this, the last area that I would consider is memory contributing, and this would be in, in all three, in PSP, um, MSA, or late stage PD. Um, and is it really truly just that they are forgetting, they're not remembering what aid that they need to be able to ambulate safely? And for that, we will um, use space retrieval, which I'm going to talk a lot about later. And I forgot to go back to the example of the um, person who makes all the cakes. We actually, he was falling a lot in the kitchen because he had an island and every time he would turn quickly, he would lose his balance or reach something out of the cupboard, he would lose his balance. And so we spent a lot of time reorganizing his kitchen and planning out how he was going to make his cakes. And that was effective. Next. 
incontinence, you've heard a little bit about that so far today. And when we first get an MSA patient, we're gonna be focusing attention on bladder and even bowel for constipation. And incontinence being a huge factor for them over our other clients, although you will see it in PSP too, and even in-stage Parkinson disease. And with overall MSA and in-stage PD, it's a lot of storage problems with the frequency, they have urgency, urgent incontinence, nocturia. With MSA, they can also have voiding problems. So those are the people that require catheterization. And PSP, they tend to have more incontinence at nighttime. So for physical therapy when I'm screening, um, I might be saying, hey, are you getting out of bed in time to go to the bathroom? Are, are you walking or do you have to get into a chair to get into the bathroom? How is that going for you? Have you tried um, women's health or pelvic floor physical therapy before? Um, we're lucky enough that um, to have a therapist here that just strictly does that, and you may in your community too. Um, for speech therapy or occupational therapy, um, both will be addressing this. Um, are you remembering to use the bathroom on a routine schedule, like incorporating some of those behavioral modifications? Um, is, is the memory the barrier, impulsivity the barrier, kind of going through that? So OTs being queens of, and kings of DME and adaptive equipment, um, one thing to keep in mind, for those people who are stray cathing, elevated toilet seats with a cutout might be a lot easier for them if, in order to get that catheter in so they have room, especially for the women. Um, and there's a lot of seats out there that even you can do a side cutout or a front cutout, depending on what the person's already used to for cathing themselves. Um, now, if you go too high with the raised toilet seats, then that can affect their bowel programs, especially since a lot of them have constipation issue. Um, you know, like our low toilets are, as we raise it, it decreases the angle at our hips, and you kind of want to be more at 120 degrees, a lot of, I've heard from Women's Health PT say, to help with those bowel movements. It puts it, everything in a better position. So. If you raise it up to make it easier to stand up, do we need footstools? How's that gonna play into our safety plan? We don't want them tripping over those footstools either. Sometimes it's easier to have more than one on for each foot rather than two, one little one where their legs have to be together, but kind of legs more out. Um, the picture, this is a picture right here. That is a catheter inserter. And for people who've worked with spinal cord injury before, you may be familiar with that. Um, we have tried it with one of our clients with MSA, and it did work for a while, but it's basically for people who don't have that fine motor control to thread that catheter in. And so it's just more of a gross motor movement. Um, and Jenny, talk about teamwork here. So this client, it, the lever was too big for her, a metal part back there. And so Jenny's husband, being an engineer, he actually cut it down, the metal piece, <laughs> so she wouldn't run into the toilet, because she actually didn't have a cutout on her toilet. It was already a higher ADA toilet. Um, and OTs do play a role in this, as far as um, if when you look at all the education that they're getting from the nursing, because the education could come from the urology office, or from the Parkinson office, or from the nurse from the doctor's office. Um, but a lot of times checking in, how is the fine motor ability of cathing going, um, gets missed. Um, incontinence pads, absorbent sheets, we're going to talk about a case study where, you know, for that incontinence at night, incontinence during the day, trying to f recommend the best, and this is where your nurse is going to be your friend on this, trying to put your heads together a lot of times in our team meetings. That's what we're discussing. Okay, they tried this pad and this pad, or this attends. What, what, how else can we help them out here? So they're not spending all their time cleaning. Um, clothing adaptations, of course, with the ta tailor sewing on the Velcro, um, button extenders, anything to make it easier to get to the bathroom um, for that urgency. Um, female male urinal, a lot of times the male urinal is just too small, especially if they have fine motor issues, it's just too hard. And so they like the female urinal better, or a lot of my clients have, especially from the rural areas, have made their own urinals 
out of coffee containers, all different things. Um, but the female urinal is kind of a good one. And there are urinals that are spill proof, not 100%, but um, they are out there. And then bidets are becoming more and more popular, very popular in different parts of the world. And now they're becoming cheaper here for the bidet that fits right over your toilet. So at least for the cleaning purposes, they don't have to get their loved one into the shower to clean them off if they're having trouble um, for some of them. Um, but behavioral modifications, and this is, this is tough when people, especially at that nighttime incontinence issues, um, but we are trying to look at establishing their routine. And I have a couple charts after this slide that kind of just has a couple ideas about that um, by using avoiding diary. Um, some people are just so surprised at when they are taking their fluids. Like they, the, the voiding diary, kind of like a food diary, really kind of helps shed some insight into habits. Um, one of our PTs, actually our women's health PT, has people mobilize their fluids before bedtime by doing ankle pumps with their feet kind of up, trying to mobilize it before so they can go to the bathroom before to hopefully try to decrease incontinence. But it really is looking at, yes, we don't want them to not have fluids because that's going to make the constipation worse and for MSA make the orthostatic hypotension worse. But where are we drinking our fluids? And I do have a little bowel behavioral modification section there only because it, it's something that gets missed, not missed, but in this lecture presentation we're not talking about it. And just some ideas are really having them look at their fiber and fluids, the height of the toilet, um, their exercise helps, routines help, and looking at stress and rushing, because that will make it worse. And those are just a couple slides. Um, one more complex, one definitely a lot easier, which unfortunately is hard to see there. And we had a client, we're calling Jane, who had MSA, and she's the one that we, I did a lot of the adaptive, use the adaptive catheter holder, and we did that for a while, and cathing was her biggest issue for quality of life. And from the, she some days was spending two hours trying to cath herself. And unfortunately, she was in an assisted living where she had private caregivers, and the private caregivers were not allowed to help her cath. And because it was assisted living, the nurses on the floor couldn't help her cath either. And because her husband lived with her in this room, they didn't want to go to the advanced nursing home area. They wanted to stay in their room together. And we spent a lot of time on looking at every aspect of this. Jenny was looking at the bed mobility piece, trying to maximize how quick it is to get there. She and I spent a lot of time with the toilet seat, um, doing hand different exercises, trying to keep it open because she was really getting tight in the hands. Um, and at, then at a certain point when we were like, okay, this is, this is beyond our help as therapists and we need to look at alternatives. And it, in this particular case, we advocated for a suprapubic tube and unfortunately the urologist wouldn't do it because of fear of infection, even when it was end of lifetime. And so we got our doctors involved and we'd really tried to advocate for this client. Um, she never got the suprapubic tube, and at this point, she was up all night trying to cath herself. And, but by the end, she actually ended up getting a Foley. So don't, don't forget to ask about the, what their bladder plan is. Now, I'm going to let Jenny actually talk about Barb, because she's the one that had this client that was referred to her first about the incontinence. Um. So Barb was a late stage Parkinson's patient that was actually a patient of Julie's um, that I got called into and did a home visit with. And we don't do home visits real often, but sometimes for special circumstances for people that live within 20 minute drive or so, we'll go out to their home. And the first thing that, the reason that I was going out is because she was having a hard time getting in and out of bed and they wanted to go over bed mobility. So that was the primary reason that I was going out. And I had seen them on and off for many years. Um, so when I went into their bedroom, their bedroom was huge and there were two beds there. There was a queen size bed and then a twin bed. And I said, okay, so which bed does Barb sleep in? And the husband said, well, she sleeps in both. 
we start the night in this bed and then after she wets herself then the two of us take a shower together and I just hold her as I try to shower her off and I'll start that load of laundry and then I'll put her in the other bed so then she finishes the evening out in the other bed. Um, in which case my eyes kind of opened up and I thought, oh boy, the OT should have really come out and done this home visit. <laughs> um, so, um, this is a great example again of team care, but again, the incontinence issues that you see and the caregiver strain that you see and the quality of life issues that you see, honestly, there wasn't an easy solution for this client. Um, she was already, you know, wetting through the attends. She was already on the behavioral modifications that Amy talked about. Um, I, of course, went back with Julie and let her know because a lot of these things don't come out in their every six month visit um, to see if there was anything that could happen with uh, maybe medication changes or that kind of thing. But I think um, when you have someone that's having a problem with bed mobility, maybe asking about incontinence. Um, it was a really eye-opening situation for me and a difficult one that we didn't have any great solutions for. Yeah, and this was a case where only Jenny was involved because of, they just couldn't handle one more person. And so in the team meetings, the other team members, we would give her feedback to try with this client. So then leading into what would I do as a physical therapist, um, a huge thing is bed mobility. So that's oftentimes where people run into problems. Um, the women's health therapist has this great example. I'm just gonna bend down and get my soda from lunch. Of as we're standing all day, all the liquid in our body kind of sinks down towards the floor like this. So these are our patients that are standing or perhaps sitting in a wheelchair. So if we can get them horizontal for a couple of hours or elevate their legs for a couple of hours before bed, it can help get that fluid out of their feet, out of their legs, and hopefully then they won't be getting up to go to the bathroom 14 times in the middle of the night. Um, so getting up to go to the bathroom is a big deal, so we want to improve the speed in getting up from bed, so really working on sequencing. Um, this is something that's difficult for me to do in the outpatient clinic. We just have hard mat tables, and most of our patients are on um, for the late, later stage Parkinson's, um, so it's harder to recreate. I think those of you that are able to do home health and work in the home environment, this is vital. I've asked our providers when they give out the diagnosis of a Parkinson's Plus or Parkinson's to also tell them not to buy a tempur bed. Um, these things are quicksand and make bed mobility extremely difficult. But you can imagine, we'll talk later this afternoon about pain, um, a lot of these patients have pain, and so the idea of a tempur bed sounds so good, but it really decreases their bed mobility. Yesterday, I talked a little bit about satin. Here, there's, there's the picture of the satin kind of in the middle third of the bed to decrease friction underneath their behind so they can kind of rotate a little bit better or using the boxers. And again, trying to work with them on assistive equipment. If we can get them up in a timely manner, then there's a prayer that maybe they'll be able to do their bedside routine or be able to get to the commode or the bathroom in time. So again, my main role when it comes to incontinence is just the mobility portion of it. Um, and then of course I'm working a lot with Amy, sometimes for balance training, working with some of the gentlemen um, that want to continue to stand. Are they able to do that? Or I've also had lots of clients where I've pulled Amy in of they can get to the bathroom on time, but then trying to get their pants undone, they can't hold on to the walker. So that's the problem, in which case she can kind of help with some assistance um, as well. The other thing we wanted to talk about was pelvic floor PT. Um, limited research in late stage Parkinson's or Parkinson's Plus, but there was this really nice study that just came out um, and it looks like I didn't put, oh, there's the resource right there. Um, and this is also on your CD. So this was just looking at people with Parkinson's, primarily with male, at kind of your traditional pelvic floor, I think most of us think of it as women's health, um, but now definitely men's health as well, PT, where they look at, looked at some behavioral modifications as well as pelvic floor muscle training. Um, these people were only seen five times over eight different weeks. And here you can see their numbers, huge improvement. 
So I myself don't do this physical therapy. Um, I'm lucky enough that we have someone in house, but I think you should really be thinking in the back of your minds, have they tried it? And if not, it really may be worth a try. Um, they don't have a whole lot to lose. When I do talk to my patients though, I do talk to them about what to expect and the fact that this likely will include an internal exam. Because I've had some patients go and fail because they got so upset with the physical therapist of what do you mean you want me to take my pants off and get up on the table. Um, a lot of people think of physical therapy of I'm gonna be doing stretching and you know maybe walking on a treadmill, not necessarily having um, an internal exam done by a physical therapist. But I was really um, surprised and really encouraged by this study and thought maybe this would be a huge help for these patients. And so in terms of comparing um, PSP and MSA, they're very similar, the types of cognitive problems that we see, but I'll be talking more about um, the severity differences. So really the type that we see primarily in PSP is that frontal executive dysfunction. Um, it's the central component of their cognitive profile. Really, um, that disinhibition, which you've heard multiple times today, or the impulsivity, the, um, the lack of a, of a sustained awareness about their difficulties, which makes the ability to maintain successful use of strategies difficult. Um, in terms of MSA, all three of the different types of MSA can display also difficulty with executive function um, with, again, organization, creating and following a plan, disinhibition, lack of uh, insight and impulsivity, but not so severe. And then in late stage PD, um, this number varies in the literature, but up to 40% in late stage will have a true dementia, which in PD it's more characterized by what we talked a lot about yesterday, that slowness of thinking, that problem with um, shifting mental sets, um, information processing, and attention, and really that initiation. And of course we know that problems with speed of information processing and attention, think back to that cognitive triangle, are gonna cause problems in memory. So again, in terms of really looking at PSP and MSA, their profile is very similar, with PSP being much more severe. Um, I've talked about all these things. The only other thing is that apathy here rears its head as well, and that um, they have decreased, or what may, may be perceived as decreased motivation or withdrawal. And so something that's really important in PSP to be talking with your, with your patients, and particularly with their care providers, is that, um, that it's part of the illness this apathy or what looks like withdrawal or lack of motivation. Those are really behavioral terms to be describing the action that we're seeing, but it's really an organic brain dysfunction of the frontal lobe. So it's a, a part of the illness, they're not faking it, and what's particularly um, frustrating for both the clients and their care providers is it's really intermittent. So even within the day, they may have good times and bad times um, where they're more impulsive or less, less impulsive. So really trying to help them see if they can identify any patterns and or really optimizing and taking advantage of when you're having a good hour or two to participate together in a pleasurable activity. So um, the research has shown that there is cognitive impairment in the majority of people with PSP, 57 to 72 percent. 72% and a substantial minority of MSA between 20 and 42%. So again, the main difference is found in the severity, more severe in PSP than in MSA um, rather than the pattern. But the core cognitive impairment in both is this frontal executive function. And also really important to note that the impairment is present in the early stages of both. Look at that, 50% in, in PSP and 20 to 22% in MSA. So it should be something that we're looking at very early in the diagnosis. Because again, like I talked about yesterday, the cognitive function then affects everything that we're talking about here and how we're teaching people to manage their difficulties. All right, this is, um, the next few slides are gonna be a repeat from yesterday, but there's about 12 of you that are new today. So when we're talking about dementia, um, this is this group of symptoms, including the aphasia, apraxia, or agnosia, and the executive function with some behavior or personal, 
personality changes. Again, the combination of it to such an extent that it interferes with daily living. And ASHER, the American Speech and Hearing Association, um, gives us some guidelines for both direct and indirect. I'm going to talk about each of the direct today. On the indirect, it highlights caregiver training, and that's one thing when we're talking about PSP and MSA. Caregiver training has to be a part of everything we do because of the cognitive impact or type of impairment. Okay, so again, you can't, oh yeah, you can, it does show up there, it doesn't show up in your handout. Um, so again, the five evidence-based principles for enhancing learning in dementia, and I really want to say that once you've used a number of these strategies, you know, you can read the literature and that's one way to give yourself evidence, but actually when you start to use these um, five evidence-based principles, you, you really see that they do work. And I think it's also part of our job as, as therapists to help educate people that people with dementia can learn. They can learn to use these strategies. Yeah, they can't go back and get their PhD with dementia, but can they learn to remember to use a walker? Yes, we've seen it m many times. So that sometimes is new information with people. They think, oh, they've got dementia. They're not capable of any new learning skills. So of course, we want to strengthen memory with repetition. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Repeat what you want them to know. Um, we want to engage that non-declarative memory system, really, which means let's get the motor systems involved as well, because motor memory is a really strong memory. So anytime you're trying to get something to be learned, if you can pair it with a motor movement that promotes better learning. And again, we talked about this yesterday, reduce the errors during learning. And I'm going to talk a lot about this in space retrieval in a moment. Um, when there's a specific intervention, for instance, if we're learning self-cath, really try and focus on one thing at a time. Not having attention to multiple things, have them focus on one thing at a time, one step at a time. And try and break that sequence into very small, manageable steps. And then um, giving people choices if we're looking at recall as opposed to just free recall. Because contextual, contextual cues are always more helpful than free recall. Okay, so the Academy of Neurologic Communication Disorders and Sciences um, gives us the five evidence-based uh, practice treatments for dementia, and we're going to go through each of those. So space retrieval um, is probably the one with the hardiest literature, and um, this has been around for a long time. I think I mentioned yesterday that it initially was used with patients with brain injury, um, but the basic technique is you're choosing what you want the patient to remember, and that then at increasing intervals of time, you are asking them to accurately recall that information. So you're always doubling the interval. So can they do it? So let's say it's the example is um, the client has repetitive questioning. When's my wife coming back? When's my wife coming back? And it's really frustrating for all of the caregivers. So you're saying, well, you can always know when your wife's coming back because we're always going to write it on this uh, dry erase board right here. So the question is, how can you know when your wife's coming back? And the response that you want is, I can look at the whiteboard. And so that's the only response that you accept. And if they get it in error, you go back immediately and say, well, no, you don't ask Susie or you don't look in your wallet, you know, you just immediately say, you look at your whiteboard. So um, you start at zero seconds, then you go to 15 seconds. If they get it accurate there, you jump to 30 seconds. If they get it accurate there, you're at a minute, then two minutes, then four minutes, eight minutes. And when they have it after 16 minutes, it supposedly has gone into long-term memory. So I have used this technique for so many different things. Jenny and I can give you a thousand examples of how we've paired it to be, help people be safe ambulators. I'll give you an example at the end here about um, using it with a client with a UTI. So um, it's something that any discipline can use. And there are very good online courses that you can take and get CEUs for to become um, licensed. In, you don't have to be licensed, but to um, become knowledgeable about how to do it. Um, and this is also something that you can teach space retrieval to caregivers. Um, or assisted living facility um, caregivers. Um, the one thing you want to make sure is that we're not doing space retrieval on 10 different things at once. We're only doing it on what the priority is right now, such as can they remember to use their walker. Um, okay, the next is uh, Montessori-based interventions. This usually really works best um, 
when people are in a group situation, but this really helps people with aimless wandering or acting out behaviors, these people with dementia. So basically what you're doing is giving them an activity that they can participate in that's distracting but pleasurable and engaging. <coughs> Validation therapy comes out of the gerontology work and that is really again with someone with severe dementia to not be questioning, to not be doing reality orientation and trying to help them to say, no, your grandmother's not, she didn't, your grandma didn't come to visit you earlier because she's been dead for 40 years. No, just say, oh, it wasn't that nice that grandma came to visit. I'm sure it was really nice for you to be able to see her again. Of course, graphic and written cues you all know about. You do it with most of your clients with neurological illness. But again, you're, the basic premise here is that you're providing information that they don't have to remember in here because it's out here. So your signage, Amy's talked a lot about contrasts and making sure that the signage is, is in contrast, black on white or um, black on yellow paper, making sure that the font is large enough for them to read, making sure that the font is at eye level, um, not too high, not too low, um, and again, making sure that we don't have too many signs about everything because then they lose their impact. Um, the last point here is talking about um, photographs and words can be incorporated into memory books. Um, so I'm involved in a research study right now looking at the use of very, very low-tech picture boards or conversation topic boards, which have 16 pictures on a topic that the patient and their family have identified, and looking at if it's helpful for people with Alzheimer's dementia versus primary progressive aphasia, which is another frontal temporal dementia that Amy Peterson talked about today, looking at if this simple tool can help. And our data is not complete yet, but we really are absolutely seeing a trend in that this really low-tech um, personally relevant picture board is really improving language fluency, word retrieval, it expands language, and we've had all of these little sub things happen with, um, with participants that we didn't anticipate, such as um, we had one gal that's topic was they were going to be moving to Michigan to be closer to um, their children. This was causing the woman a lot of anxiety. And so the husband said, you can't believe every night we, when she's so anxious right before bed, we pull out that board and talk about it using these pictures and these words and her anxiety really dissipates. So there's a lot of good um, side benefits that we aren't even aware of yet. Um, the focused caregiver training program is really helping do this caregiver education and it's just an acronym to enhance communication. The F stands for make sure that the communication is functional and what we talked about yesterday, face to face. You might have to orient to topic. You might have to have really concrete topics or be offering those choices again instead of, re, um, instead of free recall using different strategies to unblock or unstick when they're stuck in communication. Um, encourage that the communication is short and simple so that they are, to, are able to follow and process that information. And um, this program can be used with both family and professional caregivers. So in terms of strategies for managing executive function, again, this is a repeat from yesterday. You want to really focus on making consistent and predictable routines doing things at the same time, doing exercise programs at the same time, using memory strategies at the same time. Um, for initiation, um, really using checklists to be helpful. And that dry erase board can be helpful for lots of different things throughout the day. I keep this slide in here because um, all of us, I think, are needing to really be able to justify the treatment that we're providing, and especially with patients with dementia. So, um, you know, you're not going to be able to um, show progress in cognitive function in dementia. So you really have to make sure that your goals are based on your assessment information. Of course, you're, they're relevant to the client and their caregiver. Um, but you're really saying that the goals are towards um, frequency of behaviors, so they're asking repetitive questions fewer times, or um, they're able to use their walker independently now because environmental signs, graphic and written cues have been helpful, or through spaced retrieval, 
you know, I, write, I put that right in my documentation. Through the evidence-based technique of space retrieval, the patient is now um, no longer choking at mealtimes because they remember to take one bite of solids and then one drink of liquids. Okay, so you're really putting in there how, how your treatment is helping, knowing that it's not gonna, you're not going to see a change in improvement in cognition. And then, of course, that last point, it just talks about, given the degenerative nature of dementia, any reassessment on your, on your um, global measures of cognition is not going to show that. So in terms of my one um, case study or that I wanted to present today, and some of you have heard this before, so I was called into somebody's home by the nurse because this gal, Margaret, was having um, frequent um, UTIs, and they couldn't figure out why. And so I went in with Margaret and did assessment of her memory, and it was very, very poor. She had moderate dementia. And then I was talking with the caregivers and talking with Margaret, and we kind of learned that her um, her bathroom hygiene was very poor. And in fact, she was wiping from the back to the front. And so we established that the question was, Margaret, when you go to the bathroom, how should you wipe? And the answer would be front to back. And so at first I was doing this third one minute, two minutes, we got up to four minutes for two or three sessions. I additionally did post signs in every bathroom that just said, remember to wipe front to back. And then three or four more sessions, we got up to eight minutes, she was able to remember the information. And I knew that I had success with Margaret when one day I walked into her apartment and it was, I was just saying hello. And um, then I said, now Margaret, how do you wipe? And she said, north to south. <laughs> So, she, such a character. So, I just loved her. So, we got it. And this was someone that, you know, had 24 hour supervision because her dementia was so bad. But she was able to learn that, and the UTIs went away. So, again, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, too, but in us really helping our referral sources, our physicians, to know, you know, we can help in lots of different ways and letting them know these unique examples of how we have been able to help. Um, okay, we didn't do interdisciplinary questions for this. Okay, Jenny's going to talk about cognition and PT. So this is a huge problem. Um, most of us have problems with home program compliance, where we give exercises to patients and they say, yeah, 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 I know how to do it, and you send them home, hopefully with some sheets. Um, and then you come back and you say, so why don't you show me your exercises? And they have this blank look on your, their face. Um, so part of this could be a cognition issue. Um, so A, working with the speech therapist, but also trying to use a checklist or a calendar. And we've gotten really, really creative. We have electronic um, charting now, so we're actually able to make these in the record where I can send them home, they can go on the refrigerator and so they can check them off every day bring them in um, to kind of hold some accountability. Also, what are their learning styles? All of us in this room probably learn a little bit different, but talking to the patient, talking to the patient's family on historically how has this patient learned um, in the past, oftentimes trying to keep exercises functional. Um, I'm thinking about a patient that had uh, Parkinson's but also significant dementia and um, kind of a motor apraxia of I was trying to do some coordination exercises with him. I was just trying to keep him moving. He was really suffering from a lot of rigidity and so we were just concerned about losing some um, range of motion and that type of thing. Ironically, his balance was actually relatively intact. And I brought out a big red TheraBall and we started playing soccer. And he totally lit up. He had a blast. And so that became one of his exercises is he would go with his wife across the street to the playground and they would play soccer with this great big red TheraBall so it was a big easy target and he could run around and get some exercise, work on hand-eye coordination, but since it was fun, it obviously was more easily to work into his daily regime. I'm going to jump in here. Can you hear me? Yeah. And say that this is a, a client that we then referred to home health because he was not able to come into the clinic anymore. Right. And I know the home health therapist continued this red ball exercise in his home health program. So um, that's another reminder. If you are making a referral to the next level of care, try and share what was really helpful and effective. Um, 
Amy said it before, repetition, repetition, repetition. These patients, it is sometimes hard to show progress in your notes, but truly they do need the very same exercise and they, you need to just kind of continue to go over it. If you give them new exercises every time they come in, they're never gonna get it. Um, so sometimes we'll do variations of a theme, but we'll keep the theme exactly the same. Um, visual, verbal versus hands-on, how best to cue them, kind of play with this. Different um, learning styles, again, for different patients. Multi-step sequencing, breaking it down and writing it out for caregivers. Here again, you have the repetition. So when it comes to bed mobility, you want to make sure that the daughter is giving the very same cues as the wife, who's giving the very same cues as the caregiver. Um, so we'll spend a lot of time and figure out what those cues are going to be for these sequ sequences for common mobility issues, writing them down, and then handing them out to several different copy, several different copies, so that all the people that um, come in contact with that patient. Sometimes when you're dealing with caregivers, there can be you know, a dozen different caregivers that are going to lay their hands on that patient. So every single caregiver knows exactly which verbal cues they're going to give to that patient to decrease any confusion. The two examples, and I think we've kind of already gone over these, these are examples um, of Amy and I and how we've worked together. There was Bill and his four-wheel walker. This is kind of trying to be an example of him. So he was one of those people that would almost use his walker as a grocery cart, pushing it way too far out in front of him. So if he started to lose his balance, it would be of no assistance at all. In which case, I believe the question was, Bill, how should you walk with your walker? My feet should be in the walker. And Amy successfully did the space retrieval, um, and we made a huge impact, really decreasing caregiver train, strain with his wife on that one, who constantly nag him. Ron and his lack of walker. So here you have the patient with the MS, or PSP and the impulsivity constantly pop up out of his chair without using his fancy U-step walker. So we work together on before you get up, what do you need to have? I need to have my walker. So again, really trying to combine forces for these difficult clients. So what I'm looking at is I'm thinking with these clients, especially with PSP, is how might the lack of inhibition and impulsivity affect the safety in ADLs? And we are looking at a lot of visual cues, not because of poor vision, but also to help the cognition. And we had one client that would never push off from the wheelchair, and we tried a visual cue out front. That didn't work. We tried a yellow piece of paper, and that stuck. And we used the yellow piece of paper with Amy's um, space retrieval, and, but then it wouldn't transfer to other chairs, only the wheelchair. And so Jenny then gave us some yellow TheraBand that we cut up, and the wife put yellow TheraBand patches on the chairs that he sat in. Or if they went to a restaurant, she would make sure to put it out, because it just worked so well, he had it down by then. So really incorporating the visual aspect to help. Um, we had another person that um, trying to learn how to use the washing machine that again vision wise the controls um, were because he moved from California to Oregon to be closer to family and they did set him up in his own place to give you some background so this was new to him and the gray controls and the gray directions with the white washing machine plus the cognitive impairment he had PSP it was just too difficult so we color coded things for the directions and so then he was able to be independent with the laundry You'll also see this when people who, when you listen to the clients, the family members, well, they always made their peanut butter jelly sandwich, and now they can't. You know, looking at the refrigerator, well, they used to be able to immediately get the jam, the peanut butter out of the refrigerator, and then go get the bread. But now, visually, it was so taxing, they couldn't scan the refrigerator, and they had trouble picking it out. So they just wouldn't do it and go sit back down. So always keeping in mind the vision. Um, I have handwriting on here, um, just to point out that it may not always be a strategy for the Parkinson Plus. A lot of my clients with MSA are able to write short because the fatigue factor or it's just not, the tremor may be involved at that point, um, but they can still usually write short notes, but PSP, there's a lot of barriers there, and this is one slide that 
I see this a lot when you, when you have a person with PSP give a writing sample. And where it's just messy handwriting or here they're perseverating up there. And I have not found strategies to work so well for the people who have this kind of handwriting. So then we have to look at, okay, what are some other strategies? Um, is it going to be, you know, a, through voice only, visual only, symbols only? Um, occasionally, I will get someone who can still write, but the vision piece is interfering. And usually for that person then, we're not using it as a memory strategy, but I'll just use it for quality of life. Like if they want to write a letter to their loved one, um, we'll create the perfect environment with lines and where they're writing. Um, instead, but we're not usually so much using it to help out with a memory strategy. And one thing that I don't have on here that I did want to bring up is driving. <laughs> Hit home on that piece again, because occasionally you will encounter people towards that late in PD who are still driving, or I see a lot of PSP people who are still driving because no one came out and even brought it up as a problem, or the people who don't quite have a diagnosis yet. Um, and, or sometimes the families don't want to be the one to say no, and it keeps coming at, up at home as a family discussion where it's creating a strain on the caregiver because they're hiding the keys, et cetera. And so sometimes I will do testing just to show, hey, you can't drive. And we have one client where I'm still the discussion. <laughs> he brings me up now. It's been a couple years later, mm -hmm. and um, about, you know, he definitely blames me for taking away his driving privileges. Um, he still remembers that, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> it had emotional significance, I guess. That client came into my office about two weeks after he saw Amy, after she had finally said, you can't continue to drive, or it's not my recommendation that you continue to drive. And he had a tennis ball in his hand when I met him in the lobby. And I said, what's this for, Doug? He said, oh, I'm going to show you all that my, my reaction time is really good. So he's bouncing the ball and catching it, bouncing the ball and catching it. Oh, and one more thing for those therapists that in our afternoon discussion group said that they don't have access to a speech therapist, your neuro-occupational therapist may, can offer a great deal of help in some of these cognitive aspects that Amy has also talked about. And just one more note on that patient. It was such a huge relief to the family to have Amy to blame everything on. Yeah. Because then it wasn't the wife and it wasn't the kid. And I mean, it took a lot of time to get to that point. But again, yes. the blame's on Amy, which is kind of a joke within our clinic on this patient. But again, it was a huge relief um, for the caregivers to A, have that deci decision made, but also that patient doesn't have any angst towards any of them. And, I mean, j just to show you, because you would think, well, of course he wouldn't drive. Well, I think this was the client that was on a highway, and he would pull to the shoulder to pick flowers on the highway. And so we hear stories like this. This was also the patient who went to renew his license and wrote that he had dementia on the application at the DMV, and they proceeded to give him his license with no questions asked. Happy trails. <laughs> Moving on to orthostatic hypotension. <laughs> um, so just giving the definition of what is orthostatic hypotension at the PCO, usually they'll have a patient stand for at least a minute before they take the vitals. I think as physical therapists, we can all be doing this on our patients. The interesting thing that we'll kind of see as I go through this data is a lot of these patients may not be symptomatic. So if you have just your elderly patient, you would expect them to have symptoms with these kinds of drops. But um, some of these MSA patients may not have symptoms. But I think it's good to document, um, especially if you have any suspicion of either A, kind of as a red flag item, or B, is this impacting your treatment. Usually orthostatic hypotension is worse in the morning. And part of that's because we've laid down all night. That fluid's been gone through our kidneys um, and so now we have overall decreased fluid and so that first thing in the morning um, is going to be a little bit worse. Also we've been lying down just for a long time. Quick position changes, warm environment is going to generally lower your blood pressure so you can kind of picture yourself. This morning when I woke up I've been laying in bed for quite some hours. I pop up real quick because my alarm clock told me I had to come to work today. I'm nice and warm because I've been snuggled underneath my comforter all morning. 
Um, so I've got three things right there in terms of risk factors that are leading to potential orthostatic hypotension. The other thing is ingestion of food, which we'll come to a little bit later in terms of a therapeutic approach can decrease your blood pressure. It's important to know that these can, this problem can lead to falls, and it's often multifactorial for treatment. I think Amy Peterson did a really good job of going over that this morning. And this was a great picture that I stole from the internet. And I was showing this to Julie Carter yesterday, and she said, is this the picture of the medical provider right here standing at this crossroads and for between Parkinson's disease, MSA, pure autonomic failure, or other causes of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Um, it's hard sometimes to know exactly what may be causing these symptoms. This just as easily could have been Leanne listening to her story this morning of suffering for so many years before getting the diagnosis. Um, so MSA, it's commonly seen orthostatic hy hypotension because of the autonomic dysfunction. We just have some nice statistics of um, the prevalence. Causes falls in almost 55% of the patients. So again, really quizzing your patients of what is causing the falls, where are those falls occurring. Um, a lot of these patients can't quite say, well, I fall because I become really lightheaded after I stand up from bed for a long time. So doing a good, thorough, subjective exam. And this comes, again, only 12% of the patients were symptomatic with 24-hour testing. So they may not feel that lightheadedness. They may just go down. PSP, it's present, but not as common as the MSA. And late stage, it's kind of in between. So we have 26% of patients. 8% of patients are actually passing out. Um, one thing that I did read is you may not see it as often. Once you're in stage five, technically that definition is your bed bound or wheelchair bound, in which case you're not doing those transition um, positions so much. So they may have it, but it's just not as prevalent because they're not experiencing it in the sit to stand. Um, can occur due to medications. So again, if you do see this, this is a great time again to send that note back to the provider to say that they're having this issue because perhaps they can just do a change in medications to improve it. And incidence increases with higher age and longer disease duration. I'm sure none of us are really surprised there. In terms of screening questions, the big questions are, are, having, are you having difficulty making it to the bathroom on time? So oftentimes when we wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, we need to go to the bathroom now. Um, so one of the treatment strategies is, well, we want you to sit on the edge of bed for several minutes until you may not feel lightheaded, and then I want you to maybe do some ankle pumps, and then I want you to stand and just wait there for a couple minutes. Well, sometimes when the bladder calls, there's not time to slow down. Um, so maybe working with your OT on that. And then Amy Peterson kind of alluded to this as well, the support hose. So one of the really common treatment strategies is to get the compression garments. And for those of you who are men in the audience, none of you have wrestled with pantyhose. For those, well, likely have never wrestled with pantyhose. Um, for those of you females that have put those on, um, compression garments are much, much more difficult. So you can imagine if you have mobility issues, fine finger issues, um, this may not be something that's very feasible. So oftentimes I'll work with Amy to see if we can um, get some yeah, I'll of those assistive it. devices, I don't know what they're called, um, to make that a little bit easier. Again, trying to go back to the evidence and see what's been shown to be effective. Um, we do need to be monitoring people's vitals with their exercise. So there's two studies done here. Both of these were done in the supine position, so theoretically taking out any transition motions. And they basically found that after just a little bit of exercise, it dropped blood pressure. So you can imagine the implications if somebody's riding at 90 over 50 to begin with, and we have them do a stationary bike, um, it might become dangerously low. And that's because of the vasodilation in the skeletal muscle. Because of the neurogenic implications, you're not getting the compensatory vasoconstriction. So um, that's just not happening at a neurogenic level. So that's why most of what we're doing is compensatory strategies. And here they took the very same study design in terms of doing supine um, 
cycling with that little cycle that was uh, shown over here. Um, but they looked at different types of MSA patients, so the cerebellar type versus the Parkinson's type. And they were kind of surprised, but they found that there was a big difference. Um, so the idiopathic Parkinson's patients here were similar to control in that there was no change in blood pressure after um, exercise with standing, but the MSA type C, so the cerebellar, had a decrease in blood pressure. So this kind of helps you identify the populations that may be at greater risk when you're doing exercise. Um, but both of the populations had a decrease in blood pressure with the standing. So I would likely probably do it with all of my patients, but this kind of indicates the cerebellar patients may be at an increased risk. In terms of treatment, again, monitor those vitals. Share those with your providers if you think that they're worrisome. Um, swimming's been recommended due to the hydrostatic uh, pressure of the water. So you have that on their legs and on their trunk, which is artificially going to raise their blood pressure a little bit. And then this was an interesting exercise I found in one of the um, papers that I read. And they said holding knees to squeeze the legs before rising, they suggest that you just pull alternating legs up 10 times before you came up. Um, helped prevent orthostatic hypotension with the sit to stand. And I thought it's definitely a little bit more aggressive than just the ankle pumps down at the ankle in terms of getting the whole leg moving. Again, trying to do that education, if possible, no quick postural changes, especially after getting up. Trying to schedule activities for later in the day. Usually their orthostatic hypotension is a little bit worse in the morning and gets better as the day goes on. Avoiding what we're doing here today, just standing behind a podium. Um, have people do more walking instead of just um, motionless standing. Avoid warm environments and also avoiding the Valsalva maneuver, which goes back to working with the OT when it comes to bowel movements, because you can imagine a lot of our patients are using it um, with their constipation in that setting. And then we're going to hand it off to the OT. So kind of like I discussed before with the fall prevention, looking at orthostatic hypotension, I'm thinking the same lines. Um, looking at the barrier-free way of getting to the bathroom, um, do they, would they benefit more from the commode next to the bed, knowing that it's going to take a little bit to get their blood pressure up, and now we're not going to make it to the bathroom? Um, I didn't, last time I did, forgot to mention about the condom catheter. Um, Get to know your nurse as well, because not all condom catheters are made the same. And sometimes for men, this a lot of men don't like it because it falls off or, or they just don't like something there. But not all condom catheters are made the same. Some stick better. Sometimes nurses will know a little extra trick with like the lollipops to go around first to make sure it sticks easier. Um, so definitely, a lot of times the hospitals have, the che have a cheaper brand that don't work as well. Um, and there's just be aware there's different brands that may work for them. Um, and good lighting. So we're kind of combining the orthostatic hypotension with reducing falls, but realizing there's that urgency. Um, so there's a lot to think about. And if there is that, a lot of times caregivers are helping people get to the bathroom faster or help them up because they may have blood pressure issues, so they're going to be there with them, making sure there's a call light system in place. Some of the ideas that we talked about yesterday. And looking at the non-pharmacological interventions, um, caffeine was mentioned before, increasing salt and fluids, again, monitoring the fluid intake for that nighttime, decreasing alcohol, eating smaller, more frequent meals, and like Jenny said, no Valsalva maneuvers on the toilet, and elevating the head of the bed up a little bit um, so it's not, they're not having a fight from that total flat position all night long. And these, I don't know if you've had a chance to try those. I never thought they worked, but I never had tried them. And so I had Salmon's Preston deliver a couple versions to me to try, and they really do work. It was a lot easier for me to put it on someone if I was a caregiver. And I have some clients that have earlier, um, they're earlier diagnosed, so they still have pretty good overall function. But they really like this tool to get those compression garments on. So in terms of speech and language pathology, um, 
I'm, I'm not sure we have a lot to offer to this particular symptom management, but I think it's important today that you're just learning about what some of these symptoms could be so that you know what to do, um, how to manage it, or how to make that referral to OT or PT um, if you're hearing the clients tell you these things. So Jenny tells a story that you know, one day I walked into her office kind of wide-eyed saying, my patient's saying they're going to faint if they stand up. What's happening here? And so she had to provide education to me on this topic. So I think just knowing um, that your patients with PSP and MSA are susceptible to this and getting that knowledge for yourself. And then, of course, in terms of cognition, again, Jenny, both Jenny and Amy have lots of excellent strategies um, that they're helping people to manage um, this hypotension, so making sure that they've got the adequate cognitive function to do that, and if they can't, how are you helping them to help the clients remember their strategies? Let's take a few questions. So we're going to take a break after this, so any questions on those first four areas? Cognition, hypotension, falling? Yes. Do I have any specific cognitive assessments that I do? I do. I use the CLQT, which is the Cognitive Linguistic Quick Test. Um, I use the BADS, which is the Behavioral Assessment of Disexecutive Function. I use the Test of Everyday Attention. Um, of course, sometimes I might use the TRAILS. Those are the three, especially the CLQT looks at five different cognitive domains. That is the one that's recommended by the National Parkinson's Foundation. So um, you really get a good sense of all three. I absolutely recommend against using the MMSC because it doesn't really provide good information about dementia. I'm not sure if in our packets we have, yes, you have yesterday's presentation as well, but all of that is in there, all, all my assessment information. Another question? Um, Jenny, you want to repeat that question? Um, so the question is, what do you do with the patient that has hypotension in the morning and then hypertension in the afternoon? I've had those patients. It's not uncommon in this population, and I work with the provider. Um, usually I start with the neurologist, because sometimes the primary care provider may not understand the neurological underline of what may be going on. So usually I'll start with the neurologist, and then if they want to, they might hand it off with the primary care. But a lot of that's going to be medication management of maybe doing an antihypertensive around noon to maybe kick in for the afternoon. Yeah. Red shirt. Why to put the bed up eight inches? So, so rather than being completely flat at night, so when they first get up, if they're jumping out of bed, it's just a way of, um, like some people, if they're not going to sleep like that, like before they get up, if they don't have to go to the birth room, they'll gradually increase, if they have the ability to have like a hospital bed, they'll gradually increase the head of the bed up. So it's just not, a, it's not such a sudden shift from being completely flat to upright 90. And the head up would also be indicated for GERD. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe maybe kind of that person in their orthostatic management there may struggle with them more because we've had them basically sleep upright that whole period of time. Right. So that's where I guess you're saying don't do that for a six hour period. You're saying if you happen to get out of bed and maybe your last two hours and you stay elevated. A lot, of pe a lot of the doctors want them to be elevated slightly at the head of the bed. Yeah, I think that's for a GERD type mm -hmm. of situation more than orthostatic. You mm -hmm. have to weigh your risk mm -hmm. mm -hmm. ratio, right? Right, right. Gray? I'm not sure if it comes in the middle, but I'm curious about the hallucinations that are happening at night and affecting the bathroom. And if you might give some examples of hallucinations that I might be looking for or how I might ask that question. 
So the question regarding hallucinations and how that might affect going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, et cetera. So of course, first of all, we're going to talk with the providers about how to manage those hallucinations, and it might be changes in medications. Um, I can't think of a specific example where the hallucinations got in the, in the middle of bathroom in the night. The kind of hallucinations that have been reported to me um, are, you know, I think there's a really big range of hallucinations, but the kind that have been reported to me are usually non-threatening, um, but images of things, like I have a client that talks very vividly about having to leave the basement door open at night because the Boy Scouts are having their meeting in his basement and he absolutely wouldn't want to shut them in. Sometimes I've been at his home in the middle of the day and he's mentioning, look at the multitude of squirrels that are outside. And there might be one squirrel, but he sees dozens and dozens of squirrels. But I think that there's such a variety. Julie? Uh, one other thing you might, just in terms of that, the question you ask, you can ask, sometimes do you feel like you're um, um, dreaming when you're really awake? Which is different than, which is basically a hallucination. So, so Julie's saying that a good clarifying question is, sometimes do you feel like you're dreaming when you're really awake? To look at hallucinations. Let's just take one more question and then go on our break. I just want to comment about the hallucinations. Um, the information that I had was that, and I'm not sure if this is um, as a side effect of the Parkinson's medication or the uh, primary organic problem with hallucinations, but most often the content does involve children and small animals. And that was my mother's experience as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that was a comment. We have one more question. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Um, do you have a specific um, assessment you like to use for patients that still have issues or I work on balance? Sure, the question is do you have a specific assessment for patients who still think they should be driving? So Amy and I work really in, in tandem with each other on this. And you know what I talk to patients about is what are the requirements of driving? So divided attention, route finding abilities, um, adequate neck rotation, so we'll get physical therapy involved there, and adequate vision, and endurance, not having fatigue. So what I use to, to look at, I might use the trails, A and B, to look at speed of processing and divided attention. The test of everyday attention has an excellent section on divided attention, and the BADS, the behavioral assessment of this executive function, has an excellent um, subtest on route finding. And then I'm going to let Amy jump in. In this particular client, I did the MVPT only to prove my point, even though I knew it was going to be severely impaired, and it was. Um, it took us two sessions to get through it. 